challenges of public communication by the federal government in a depressed economy and solutions. And Senior Advocate of Nigeria wants completion of election petitions within 60 days before swearing in. Every Nigerian public authority or agency usually attributes its failure to achieve its goal and objectives to challenges such as inadequate funding, shortage of expertise, lack of political will, and policy inconsistency. It would be strange to hear anyone adding the role of communication to the challenges. Yet, the country's most intractable problem is poor communication. A typical Nigerian organization, communication is generally taken for granted. The usual assumption is that people know or ought to know several things while no effort is made to ascertain whether such things have been made known to them or whether those who may have been informed even understood the information. Consequently, when different public policy actors in the country operate across purposes with one another, it is simply a reflection that Nigeria is not a communicating nation. To help us understand this issue, joining us live is Uche Wara, PhD, adjunct professor of marketing, Continent States University, USA. Easy, if I may call you that. Uh, Doc would have been better. Uh, Doctor Wara would have been better, but I know that beyond that uh, Western title. There is also a traditional title. Uh, good evening and welcome to Plus Politics. Good evening, Bola. Thank you very much. Thanks for having me. Uh, I want you as a communications expert, somebody who has been in the industry both, uh, both locally and internationally, and who has uh, given some decades into it, why is it that we seem to be having a, communica a widening communication gulf between uh, public authorities and majority of Nigerians? Well, I think uh, it, it's uh, like you rightly observed, it's a general problem in the sense that uh, uh, in some organizations and even some uh, government agencies, uh, whether the local government, state level, and even to some extent the federal government level, the people that are being charged with that responsibility of communicating the goals, objectives, policies, activities of the government have in the past been people that do not have uh, the requisite qualification and the background as well. So. That's why it appears that uh, uh, many will argue that uh, you know these agencies that I mentioned have not really been communicating very well. So what does that tell us? It tells us that there is a need for people who are trained in the art of communication to be given such responsibilities. And I recall uh, like two, three months ago when the Nigerian Institute of Public Relations held their annual AGM. And part of what the new president said, you know, in his speech, talking about Dr. Ike Niliago, was that he expects that in, during his administration or during his tenure, you know, that government agencies that he hopes to enforce with the Council of NIPR such that government of government agencies and even the government itself will only employ people that are well trained in communication, in the art of communication, to handle such function. So I think there's a problem that has been identified. And you can see also that, like I mentioned, the agency or the body, the professional body responsible for communication in Nigeria is now beginning to move uh, you know, in that direction, which is why 
the Nigerian Institute of Regulation found it very, very uh, encouraging that the current Minister of Information is a fellow of the profession. And as well, uh, the, the current uh, Controller General of Customs is a fellow of the profession. So we're beginning to see you know, a move towards getting people that are trained in communications, in public relations, to handle such strategic roles. Thank you. Uh, there was a time when we were growing up when organizations such as MAMSA would literally choke our earlobes with uh, content. You know, you were going in any direction, you could, you could get to hear radio and the TV jingles uh, blaring off with uh, MAMSA's content. As we speak, is it the proliferation of uh, public communication platforms, especially the social media platforms, is there, and the seeming granularity that they offer an average person? Is it that, or is it poverty that is making people to just be somewhat disconnected from authorities? What, what's been your observation, your professional observation? First well, I, I'm very, I'm very, I'm very glad that you mentioned Mamsa because uh, in the 80s and 90s we recall, uh, you know, the activities of Mamsa. Mamsa means uh, uh, mass mobilization and social, uh, economic and rehabilitation. You know, something like that. I think it was during the era of Obagida. Yes, they yes. also ha had a war against indiscipline campaign. You recall right. that very well. Yes. And those were those were policies of the government that really resonated in the sense that they were able to achieve, you know, the objectives that those uh, programs were supposed to achieve. I recall that there was one very popular campaign that they ran, and I think it was 1984 and 85. Recall the one that they did with a guy called uh, Ennebeli, huh? en en yeah, that's the, to, the one that he got. And we check it out. I mean, it still resonates still today. You know, and uh, that was what uh, the federal government put out to discourage people from jabbing. You know, but again, you would expect that, you know, with the rate that Nigerians are, you know, in a mad rush to leave the country, you know, such kind of campaigns will come back. Now, back to your question. I should think that now with modern technology, with social media, uh, because at the time that months and the white campaigns, right, we only had the NTA. You know, the broadcast, system, the broadcast ecosystem in Nigeria had not been liberalized. But still, you know, they were still able to push those projects across. But today, you know, we're spoiled for choice. You know, Instagram, Facebook, TikTok, you know, several newspapers. You know, look at us now, you know. You're, you're sitting in your studio, I'm sitting at home, and I'm talking with you. So the government and all those agencies responsible for, for driving and pushing policies are spoiled for choice in terms of the communication systems and the media they can use to drive and push their policies. So why, why is that not happening? I think that's another... That's another uh, 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 but the multiplicity, the multiplicity or the proliferation of the platforms also speak to, uh, also speak to the fact that the cost of running uh, promotions, the cost of engaging all those platforms would naturally also increase. And, uh, yeah, but we, yes, yeah, but the guys that are, are driving these policies have not come to tell us that the challenge is with cost, you know. Because let's look at it. Okay, let's even look at the federal government. They still run the machinery of the NTA, which is easily the biggest uh, TV broadcasting organization in Africa. You know, they have all the regional NTA. You have federal federal corporation of Nigeria. You have the agency of Nigeria. You have uh, Voice of Nigeria. And, then, and also because of the federal government's power, the powers that they have, they are usually able to influence even the state-owned media as well to help them in terms of pushing some of their policies and agenda. So I think maybe the challenge, that's my, you know, as my, my view, challenge probably could be that there hasn't been like a well thought out communication plan, you know, because for you to, any communication activity that you intend to carry out, you know, begins with a plan, a plan of what is our agenda what is our objective what do we want to achieve okay once you have that objective and you have all that set out then you now talk about the resources how are we going to do this you know you have your friendly media and then you also have what you call not so friendly media how do you reach them okay so it's sometimes some of these things are done based on goodwill which is also why 
when you are appointing people to such positions, usually people will argue that it's better to appoint people from the industry. Because if you appoint some people from the industry, they have leverage. You know, there will be people that they worked with in the past. Those people may be occupying very senior positions in the media. So they're able to leverage on some of those things. So some of these things are not really paid for. But again, it's the relationship that matters. So cost is not a problem. That's number one. And at the same time, I'm also I'm not saying that it doesn't cost money to execute a communication activity. Of course, the federal government, the state government, the local government, even organizations, if you want to carry out the computer, there should be budget attached to it. Okay, but again, it depends on how you manage the budget. Then some of the other things you can get pro bono. Yes. I'm just wondering, I got to know you in England about 20-something, going 30 years ago, and until date, you will agree with me that the BBC is still a reputable platform where an average serious-minded person like yourself or myself would quickly flip to wanting to validate or confirm a story. I know, let's be honest with ourselves, I know that even the social media platforms are re really wrestling uh, the BBC space in, 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 say, in England and in some other you know, advanced countries like in America where you lecture I know that the social media platforms too wrestle you know, the platforms, you know, the credible, uh, credibility uh, space with some of these reputable organizations. But having said that, why are some, uh, why is it that the NTA does not have the octopusal reach that the BBC seems to have in a place like United Kingdom? Well, uh, I I think let me give you a case study. Uh, uh, I mean, I don't, I, I'll probably need to mention names. I was appointed the managing director, chief executive officer of Anambra Broadcasting Service in 2014 by the immediate past governor of Anambra State, Chief William Obiano. That was following a nationwide competitive uh, interview process. When we went in there, I mean, you know, the things that we met on ground, you know, I mean, it's, it was huge, huge and, you know, hugely challenging. But we, we, we set out at it. And what did we achieve? Within the space of uh, six years, we had over a million followers on our Facebook portal, you know, Facebook platform alone. And why I'm giving this example is, you may be a BBC, you may be an NTA, you may be a Radio Nigeria. That's not enough. You need to do the hard work as well of building credibility, you know, pushing content because you should know that you're in competition with the new upstarts. Okay? This is the age of citizen journalism. This is the age where everybody sitting at home can tweet, send information. People, you know, so this is the age of uh, social media influencing. So I think it's more uh, a task for the managers of uh, some of these media houses to begin to see themselves as also competing for, you know, for patronage, competing for attention competing for listenership, and don't just rely that, hey, we're NTA, we're Radio Nigeria, ultimately people come to, you know, it doesn't work like that. You know, because ask yourself, look at what has happened to the print, print media. How many people still buy newspapers? You know, because everything now is on the platform, is on, on your phone, your smartphone, which is why cleverly some smart newspaper organizations, I mean, I'm talking about Punch newspaper, I'm talking about, you know, the Trust, Sun newspaper, some of them have also migrated online, and you can see that they are beginning to get traction. Some of them command millions of followers, you know, in terms of traffic on their websites. So the, the idea is, yes, there's proliferation, but it also offers opportunity to engage with more people. Uh, because uh, imagine if, what, ask yourself, a punch newspaper, a daily sun, and some of these newspapers, how many hard copies do they print every day? Some of them don't even do more than 5,000 copies every day. But online, they're able to reach over a million, you know, people on a daily basis. So I see it as an opportunity rather than a threat. But it's now for people running these agencies, the media agencies belonging to the federal government and to the state government. It's now for them to, they need to up, you know, the ante, they need to, you know, up their game to be able to compete, you know, with the private operators. I cannot engage somebody like you on a topic like this and not uh, bring, bring to fore the fact that we have a dedicated agency that was created by decree in 1993 and which has transmuted into an act of parliament now called the national 
Orientation Agency, NOA. In fact, by the very appointment of the incumbent minister, it's been elevated to a ministerial, a ministerial entity, uh, level. So uh, what would be the suggestion of somebody like you to whoever is running that agency, especially when the incumbent minister is a fellow of an organization where you are also a leader? Well, uh, I think they have their job cut out for them, you know, in a way. Uh, I read in the papers, was it last week, they recently appointed a GG, you know, for that agency. I think they have a lot of work to do. You know, because I, I look at NOA today and I'm, I'm thinking about the Mamsa, Mamsa days. I'm thinking about war against the display days. We need to see, uh, first of all, what are the issues in the society? What NOA, what are they supposed to be doing? First, I think, you know, sensitization. There are all kinds of ills, there are all kinds of challenges in the society. How is NOA able to push? NOA is not just there to be a government mouthpiece, you know, just to push what the government uh, wants, you know, what the government is doing. NOA is actually supposed to be it's a national orientation agency. What is orientation? Orientation, you know, suggests that there are things that are ills in the society that need to be corrected. What are some of those ills you and I know in the society? There's high level in discipline in society, particularly among the young persons. It's, it was in the news yesterday about the student from Miniport that killed the girlfriend yeah, and all that. So we see young people now beginning to get into rituals. Those are the kind of job that the NLA is supposed to be doing. Okay, are people following the queue? If you go to a bank or if you go buying, these are some of the things that NOA should be getting into. So we want to see them do more. Yes, I cannot but want to. I, I know this is consultancy is and it's not supposed to be. It's not supposed to be cheap or free, but uh, we just have to give something back to the community that uh, that made us. I, I think I read in. Uh, was it your autobiography when you were about living your last uh, this thing that uh, you are really passionate now about also giving back? So that's one of the reasons that made me. But let's be honest with ourselves. It, it does seem that the public is somewhat now uh, functionally and organically disconnected from government agencies. Uh, and for somebody like me who really believes that one of the best ways for us to annex the inherent advantage of the population is for us to at least have a governizing authority or a governizing force that will let us realize the innate powers economically, creativity-wise and otherwise and I'm not seeing that being being achieved in that society, and it's somewhat disillusioning for me. A professional like you, what can you speak to, and how can people like us also help people in government to know that there's a valuable wasting resource out there because they are not connecting? I think, Bola, you and I live in this country, and we know what the nation has passed through in the last one to two years. I mean, we just come off an election, national election, and a regional election in some states. And for some people, the election didn't go the way they wanted. For some, you know, it did go the way they wanted. So it kind of, uh, you know, pitted people against one another, brother against sister, neighbor against neighbor, friend against friend, colleague at work against colleague. I think the very first thing we need to do is start the process of national healing. Yesterday, the Supreme Court, in their wisdom, came out with a final decision that President Bola Tinubu is the you know elected president of Nigeria. So it is hoped that now that we have the politics behind us, yes, there are still some cases. You know, at the appeal courts, you know, uh, it will involve uh, some members of the House of uh, House of Reps and some members of the Senate. You know, but again, people are more focused on that of the president. So we seem to have that point now where we can say, yes, definitive, this is where we're going to be for the next four years. So you will now expect 
that the APC government, having now uh, gotten that judgment yesterday from the Supreme Court, to now begin a serious process of national healing. Very, very desirable. I was in Lagos at the time of the gubernatorial elections. We know all the things that were said, all the actions, all the activities, you know, from you know that was done against a particular ethnic group by another ethnic group. So it's now time for us to move on. You know, what I mean by move on is the government has to now be seen, you know, to be pulling everybody, pulling the house together. If that doesn't happen, it does not matter what the communicators or all the various media agencies belonging to the government, it doesn't matter what they say. Critical thing in communication is credibility. It is source credibility. The person talking to you, the person talking to you, telling you to do this or do that, what is the credibility of that person? Okay? Another very important ingredient in communication is, another very important ingredient in communication is empathy. The person, the source communicating must have empathy, you know, for the other person. So once we put all these things together, then we might begin to see understanding. We might begin to see that process of healing happening. Now, let's ask ourselves as well. I think the President Bola and the government, they've been able to, you know, appoint, you know, SA, media, SSA. I think they have about five, six people have, handling different functions in public communication. Would that solve the problem? You know, is that the solution to the problem? Okay. You read some of these things. And I, what I think the federal government is doing is their communication model and approach is a bit top down to me. You know, they sit up there and are talking down to the people. I haven't seen that attempt or that aff effort to try grassroots communication. Grass what, mean, what do I mean by grassroots? I think about my, my mother in the village. I think about my relatives in the village. Do they hear from the federal government? You know, how? You know, because it's not enough that you go on Twitter and post a message. You know, how many people are on social media? You okay? You put it in the newspaper, how many people read newspapers? You put it on TV, how many people can afford the, you know, the DSTV uh, subscription monthly? If you look at the theory of concentric cultural diameter, 70% of the population live in the rural areas. So what's the plan? both by the federal government, the state government, to communicate with people living in the rural areas. Where are those traditional forms of communication? For I'm, 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 I'm a people man, I'm from the Southeast. There are things that we use to communicate, I mean, easily, you know, the, we call it the Ogene or the Ewe, the Gong, okay? So you can, federal government may need to begin to think about those traditional models that our parents had used, you know, okay? So it will be a hybrid integration of various systems. Not just social media, Twitter, Facebook, and all that, Instagram. Not just TV, just like we're, we're talking on TV right now. Not just radio, but what are the other aspects? I also want to see a situation where, because of you know the where we are coming from in terms of the election that just ended, even be I would advise the federal government to consider a south, a, sorry, a regional approach or a regional model. Where, for example, you know, if you come to the six geopolitical zones, or even go to the states, you begin to look for credible people that you can use, you know, that can help. Because, you know, the theory of, uh, like I talked about credibility, there are people that are called opinion leaders, opinion builders in every community, in every state, in every geopolitical zone. People may see, people may believe more things coming from people that they hold in high esteem within their community rather than what the, federal, what the government agency or government official is, is, is telling them. So these are some of the various things that I think I will advise and I will suggest, you know, that the federal government may consider going forward, you know, so that their communication and their messages, whatever it is that they want to push out, will reach the people. I, 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 really, I really empathize with those who are in government these days because, uh, um, like you rightly suggested, you know, more town hall meetings, uh, more... Uh, people's councils uh, in the West now. I think France did it not too long ago. Uh, you form people's councils and you pick uh, representatives from across all strata of society and all uh, professions and uh, uh, and uh, disciplines, so that when they meet, initially 
it gets very hot, but over time, when they start ideating and they start understanding each other's uh, uh, positions and each other's uh, uh, predispositions, a congealing of ideas, you know, consensus will be. I really want to appreciate you. You have been a value adder, our ass, for all the things you would have taken good uh, good dollars for. I'm making you give for free, but Nigeria is, apart from whatever may be the opportunities we have in other climes, Nigeria is an ancestral home. It's our home. Thank you very much. Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you, Wala. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Thank you. We're going to short break now. When we come back, we take the second segment of the show today. Mm -hmm.